On this edition of Native Report, we meet Emma Garrett, a skilled basket maker of the Eastern Band of Cherokee. And I started here at the bottom, and uh, I make corners. Trout were really not historically a, a huge part of the Cherokee culture. We see how the Eastern Band of Cherokee oh, Indians fisheries resource is managed. A rainbow trout. Okay. And we learn about Dakota astronomy. That is kind of distinctive in the night sky. We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. Eastern Band of Cherokee elder Emma Garrett learned how to make baskets as a little girl by watching her grandmother. I sat with Emma on her front porch and watched her make one of these beautiful baskets. What a beautiful thought I am thinking. At the foot of the beautiful Great Smoky Mountains in Snowbird, North Carolina, Cherokee elder Emma Garrett weaves baskets in the traditional manner. How long have you been doing it? Uh, since I was 14. Mm -hmm. Did your family do it? Did your mother do it? Uh, my grandma did. She showed you how? She tried, mm -hmm. but she didn't. I just learned it for uh, looking at it, it's river cane basket, mm -hmm. and this is double heart. Is there a reason or a story you have be behind the designs? The black is a walnut, okay. and the red one is a bloodroot, and a natural color. And the rim is a white oak, and the uh, uh, lace is for hickory. You have to. Uh, count how many you got the bottom. If you mess up, you can't make design. Well, I started off here. I cut these lengths and uh, how big I gonna make. And uh, then I started here at the bottom. And uh, I make corners. The baskets are made out of river cane. Not to be confused with bamboo, as they do look similar. Emma used to collect the cane by hand, and also bloodroot which is used as a dye. I dye, I dye this red for uh, river cane. That's the only one that can dye them river cane. But it could dye for this one too, but they turn kind of yellow. And this turn kind of orange. Last time we went, it's over to uh, where I used to work at uh, uh, Snowbird Mountain Lodge. Well, I bought this one, but they get in the woods. How do you find it? What does it look like when you are picking it? They're just about that high. Mm -hmm. It's got a big round leaf. Mm -hmm. It blooms white, you know. I just use about this bit much. Typically, it will take Emma two days to make a basket about the size of the one shown here. And it all starts with splitting the cane. Let me split them. If you don't trim them, 
it'll cut you like a knife, mm. a razor blade. I start off the whittling first, you know. I put this pad. Then uh, I do this. Then I start on this one, like this. This is white oak basket now. Emma also does beadwork and other crafts, and even has a recording career. Use me, Lord, and I service. Draw me closer every day. I be willing, Lord, to run all the way. If I but she is well known for her basket making skills. Sometimes I got so many orders. Sometimes. I can't, you know, do all that. <laughs> I make small and large, and large, <laughs> extra how is, large. How big have that? What is your biggest basket? About that big. Mm. I, I make money. That's what I live on. Did you know that astronomy played a central role in the life of the Pawnee Indians? The Skitty Band of Pawnee were known to have had a complex religion of which astronomy was a large part. Their attempts to feel connected with the sky went so far that they designed their lodges and villages with astronomy in mind. Villages were laid out in a position of the most important stars in the sky. In the last corner of the village, was a shrine to the morning star, Venus, and the west was another shrine to the evening star, also Venus. The doors of the lodges always faced east to the rising sun, and four posts representing the four most important directions, northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast, were used to hold up the lodge. The domed roof represented the sky, Part of their creation myth says that Mars, the red morning star warrior, mated with Venus, the female evening star, to produce the first humans. The pole star was considered to be a chief, protecting the stars and the people, because the north star is always up and everything else in the sky revolves around it. In 1984, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina constructed a surface water fish hatchery. The fishery serves a dual purpose. One, to enhance the fishery for the benefit of EBCI members, and two, to capitalize on the tourism opportunity. With the Great Smoky Mountains as a backdrop, Workers with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Nation Fisheries and Wildlife Program inspect one of the many holding tanks called Raceways. The fishery here in Cherokee on the Cherokee Indian Reservation is about uh, 60 years old commercially. Um, so, you know, the hatchery was, was built a long, long time ago um, with the intent of just supporting, um, you know, a, a, a stocked fishery on the tribal boundary. Um, for both enrolled members and tourists alike. Um, in 2007, you're looking at about 30,000 pounds um, behind us in these raceways, and now we're at about 80,000 pounds in these raceways, just in a matter of a few years. About 75,000 individual um, fishermen a year visit Cherokee. The fishery was started uh, as a culmination of, uh, I think, a lot of efforts. Number one, to support the tribal people, to support the, uh, you know, the availability of fish, in, in these pristine waters, you know, that, that we have here, but also to uh, stimulate and further enhance our tourism efforts. You know, this is, uh, we're adjacent 
about 40 yards from you right now is the most visited national park in the United States of America. So, you know, we have a lot of visitors here. Um, Cherokee is a tourism-based uh, community. It has been for a long, long time. And so, you know, it was a culmination of efforts of how can we enhance the fishery for the benefit of our roll members and the enjoyment of our roll members, but at the same time really capitalize on a tourism opportunity. Um, and, and so that's what we did. Tribal lands are around 56,000 acres, plus or minus, so it's, it's not a huge reservation. And, and um, the great thing is, though, we have over 60 miles of trout streams on boundary. Of those 60 miles, just over 30 miles are open to the public. So you can come to, the, to our reservation, you can buy a permit, and you can fish. So tell me about these raceways. Yeah, so I think we have approximately 26 individual raceways. And um, th there is some method to the madness. <clears throat> we don't just dump fish in them. Each raceway, each system of raceway houses a select group of, of fish that range from very, very small juveniles all the way to a trophy size and, and brood fish. So that they, they come from the nursery areas, we call it, and they move out into here in stages and basically age groups and, and size classifications. And as they grow, they fill up and as it starts getting crowded, uh, we basically come in and we grade them out so that we make sure that each individual raceway houses fish that are very, very close and similar in, in size. Before the fish are big enough to move to these outdoor raceways, they start in the nursery. What happens is, is this little apparatus here um, is where the eggs go. When we get eggs in, we put the eggs in here and it's a combination of, of water and air to keep the eggs circulating. And then th this overflow is actually so, as the babies start hatching, some of them will flow over out of the spout into this raceway. And then when all the eggs start hatching or, or a large portion of them, a certain portion, then we actually take and we siphon all those babies out into this raceway. These fish now are probably about three months old. So you can see this is, generally what a two, three month old fish looks like. They'll stay in here until their size and their growth basically just crowds them to the point where their health is, it could be degraded. You know, these fish will be in here probably another three or four weeks and then we will split this raceway to another raceway inside the building and then they'll stay for another uh, couple months and when they're large enough and outgrowing this and we have to make room, um, we'll move them outside. Um, the good thing is the same water is in here as the same water is outside. If we do it properly, there's no major shock uh, in that transition. To some people, it may not seem that important. You know, a fish is a fish is a fish, but for us, we've learned that, you know, if people can't catch a, a, a good sized fish that's healthy, pretty, and it fights hard, and that, you know, they just don't, they won't come back. Outside once again, we take a look at one of the many different species of trout, which surprisingly is not historically important to the Cherokee. We have an assortment of fish. We have uh, mostly rainbow trout, um, brown trout, brook trout, um, even a few uh, southern Appalachian brook trout, which is the only native species of trout to this entire region. And probably the most, the most for sure, uh, culturally significant trout species as you'll find. We don't have any in this hatchery, but we also help rear um, multiple other species, such as the sicklefin red horse, um, with some partner hatcheries, uh, governmental hatcheries. And the bottom feeding fish, the sucker species, historically were the most culturally significant species. Trout were really not historically a, a huge part of the Cherokee culture. All uh, right, this is a rainbow trout. And they're very, very, oh, oh. see that I told you. Go ahead, see if you can pick him up. Oh, he's See, so you can't do it. <laughs> These are slick Cherokee fish. They don't want to be caught. A huge part of the health of a trout is that slimy, mucousy membrane. Mm -hmm. And without that slime, they can't protect themselves against disease and parasites and things like that. So anyway, he's in. We're good to go. I wanted you to feel that fish just to get, show you that you may not be expert on trout, because I'm not, but you know that good slimy membrane, that real strong fish, it's hard to hold. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of fish you want to put in the river, because he pulls hard on a fisherman's line, and he stays healthy, and he grows fast, and so that's, you know, 
a lot of years in, in, in the work to uh, produce such good healthy fish. So. Visitation and the popularity of Cherokee as a fishery has grown so much that um, we're now stocking probably a hundred times the fish that we were stocking in the 80s. And so when we're up near um, half a million pounds a year, uh, which is a lot of fish. You know, somewhere around the neighborhood of probably six, seven, eight hundred thousand fish per year uh, going into our waters. So we, we kind of claim that, you know, we're probably the largest singly managed contiguous hatchery supported fishery, maybe even in the United States of America. And we're just real proud it's in Indian country. We haven't had a uh, beloved man, a leader, since 1801, I understand. It is a great honor to have it, I think, because uh, it, uh, it gives me uh, a good chance to uh, go in and uh, have a say in council, you know, and with the chief, I can visit with the chief, and uh, he listen up to me, and. Uh, the council will also. So if I see fault or it's necessary that I go in, you know, and, and make uh, comments and suggestions and, you know, all these things. Yeah, it's, it's good to, to do that because they look to me as a, a leader, you know, to, uh, and make decisions, you know, the way I, uh, I think it should be the way I think it's right. And so uh, it is great honor. Interest in Native astronomy has grown over the past 10 years, and almost all Native American cultures recognize patterns in the stars of the night sky. Interpretations and stories differ from nation to nation. Coming up next, we learn about astronomy in the Dakota culture. The sun may be shining on this late spring day, but it is what is in the night sky that interests this group of elders and educators. This is Native Sky Watchers, a workshop exploring Native astronomy. Native people were like the first scientists and more because science is so much about observation. It's about an awareness and keeping track of data, data collection, which is all based on observing the world around you. And this is exactly what Native people did, and really, really, really well. The Thunderbird constellation, it's Wakian, the Thunderbird. And we always say that the thunder beans, the lightning, is Wakan. Wakan is translated sacred, but what it really means is the power to give life or the power to take life. It's that duality, the double-edged sword, Wakan. And the Thunderbird constellation, is right there in the northern sky. The earth has a tilt, and that tilt gives us the seasons. On Mars, the planet Mars, the tilt varies a lot, and that causes a lot of extreme uh, weather and environments, but our tilt doesn't really change a lot. But it does have a little bit of a wobble, a tiny little bit of a wobble and that's because of the pull of the sun and the moon. That Thunderbird constellation is at the center of that wobble circle. So what I'm saying here is that this wobbling is really, really small that you wouldn't notice unless you were watching for thousands and tens of thousands of years. The procession, the wobble, is over a 26,000 year period. So the Thunderbird constellation is at the center of that wobbling circle. How did they know that? For Elder Jim Rock, his knowledge of the stars came from his father. 
who in turn learned about the night sky from his great-grandmother. My dad was a Sisitawan Dakota. He was a first language speaker, um, didn't speak English until he was about 12. And uh, his grandma lived to be eight days short of 100, and she mentored him in, uh, in the stars, the sky. She was a Wakbe Wiyan, a leaf woman, an herbalist. Uh, so he helped her gather the foods, and plants and medicine plants, and the stars went with those. My dad's name, uh, well, he's been gone about two years now, two and a half. And his name was Tabado Kasapa Itokab Najinshni, which means do not stand in front of the black buffalo. <laughs> and uh, they, his father gave him that name when he was just a few minutes old. Held him up to the stars around midnight when he was born in those direction. Welcome him to those relatives. Because we say we come from the stars and to the stars we return. We come from the earth to the earth we return. We really mean that uh, because those are the buffalo stars particularly. It's, uh, and there's places on earth that match those places in the sky. Specifically as the Wakpa Tanka or Haha Wakpa, what here people would say Mississippi, we called here uh, is the Wanagi Tachanku, also the Milky Way River of Stars, they match. So there's a cave by the river down here that match a star in that buffalo constellation up by the Milky Way. So like those teepee poles, they connect us literally between places here, places there. It's like a mirror. Workshop presentations also dealt with more earthly connections. I've been teaching the concept of blue woman or rebirthing, uh, which comes from part of the constellations um, of beginning life again. And uh, I've been working with young people as well as elderly, but um, the importance that I, I found was, in the connection that I found was that there is a part of our ceremony that is, is rarely done anymore, and that's the cord ceremony, which is like the, one of the first ceremonies um, that there was. And it was women's involvement that, um, that brought, um, it, uh, brought this about. We would, they would dance at the Tree of Life and during that time, and they would welcome the baby in, and, they would take the umbilical cord and they would wrap it and put it into the amulets, um, whether it was a boy or a girl. And that constellations of Kea, or the, the turtle or the salamander, depending on if it was male or female. Annette was like, you've got to bring this, you know, because my, my outlook and my, how I'm looking at it is that we have to do these things and bring about ceremony to help reconnect our children our young people, whether they're 70 years old and they've never made that connection, or if they're infants and they've never made that connection. There is some really deep and powerful, important astronomical observations that even a lot of other cultures didn't have. A lot of, some of the other indigenous cultures do have, like the Mayans. But it's, it's not just little stories that are told around a campfire for entertainment. It's so much more meaningful than that. It's really um, the observational part, the scientific part, but it really has a lot of teachings on, um, like a guidebook, how to live your life and stay in balance. Um, it's all there written in the stars. Um, the Lakota word for stars is Wichonkbe Oyate, which is translated star nation, Oyate is people, but Albert Whitehat, who studied the um, original meaning of the word before the missionaries translated them, um, found out in, that the word for star nation means human flesh. It's a Lakota teaching that we come from the stars. And you know what's really amazing is that it's also an astronomical scientific thinking. We Every single atom in our bodies and everything in the physical world was created in a star. There's, that's the only known way to make all the elements. The Makochi Wichakbi Wawapi Dakota Lakota star map, created by Annette Lee and Jim Rock is the first of its kind star map that represents an interdisciplinary approach in which astronomy, native culture, language, and art are all gracefully woven together. The map is organized with Wichakbi Awanjila, 
The North Star, or Polaris at the center, and is filled with Dakota Lakota star vocabulary, such as Wanagi Tchanchanku, Road of the Spirits, the Milky Way, and Wanagi Tchawachipi, the Northern Lights, Aurora Borealis, plus many others. The map is available at web.stcloudstate.edu slash A-S-L-E-E. For more information about Native Report or the stories we covered, find us at nativereport.org, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you for spending time with us here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you again. Stacy Thunder is Ojibwe from the Red Lake and Lakota Ray Nations and is the legislative counsel for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Professor Ted Johnson is the director of the Master of Tribal Administration and Governance program at the University of Minnesota Duluth and is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Closed captioning is provided by the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa.